Tonality 4000 feet, uh, speed uh, 180 knots, one double two. Hi, it's Natalie Flygirl Kelly, and I'm here with Fly Alyssa, and we have a special friend guest here today, Aaron Miller, and I can't wait for you to hear all about Aaron's history with her grandmother, all about her grandmother, and what she did. There she is, yes, um, to honor her grandmother, and um, I'm not going to go into any more details than that right now, but welcome to this episode of Cockpits and Cocktails. Hi, Alyssa. Hey, how are you guys? Good. How are you? I'm so good. I'm so excited to hear all about this. I've been anticipating this and building it up. And so, yeah, finally, it's so good to meet you, Erin. Well, it's good to meet you, too. And I hope I live up to the hype. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I don't know if y'all have you ever actually met. No. Okay. I don't think so. Okay. I have talked about you, Erin. Uh, with because it's like everybody well I don't know about everybody but a lot of people we've had on the podcast I've been like oh yeah my friend Aaron introduced us oh yeah my friend Aaron because <laughs> I, I mean love Natalie she, and I'm always like I want everyone to know her because she's so wonderful <laughs> oh that's so nice she, I think you're wonderful tennis, so I hope that you know you stay up there <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah Aaron I met you through how did I meet you was it through Lunar? I, I feel like Lunar introduced us. Okay. Right? Yeah. Probably at Oshkosh. Yes, too. <laughs> yeah, Lunar uh, should totally be on the podcast. Yeah. So <laughs> we met, Lunar knows like everybody. Every, every, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Lunar, Lunar could fill like three hours of our podcast. So. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could do a whole this series just with 32. Lunar. Lunar. <laughs> so um, she introduced uh, Aaron, Aaron and I, but I don't remember where we actually met the first time. I feel like the first time we met was at Ashkosh in 2017, maybe. Okay. Did you go in 2017? Uh, yes. Uh huh. Okay. And I yeah. think it's when you gave me this shirt. Oh, yeah. We were out by the P51s, I think, is when I met you. Yeah, you're right. I do remember that, actually. Was that 2017? Is it the same year I met you, Alyssa, or was it 2018? I don't know if it was 17 or 18. It was 18 at Oshkosh. 18, okay. I didn't go to any air shows until 18. Okay. Okay. Well, there you go. 18. So it was 18, yes. But I instantly fell in love with Erin. (laughs) Aw. She was very friendly and... And warm. And then I heard about all this cool stuff that she had done and all about her grandmother. So why don't you um, tell me what you do and tell me a little bit about your grandmother? Uh, So I work for the government and I don't really talk about my job when I'm doing podcasts and things. It's not like it's a secret or anything, but I don't talk about it. But anyway, uh, as a side not job, but as part of my free time. I spend time traveling the country and doing podcasts and videos and things about the women Air Force service pilots, of whom my grandmother was one. And there's a picture of her. I don't know who sees video, but there's a picture of her behind me. Yeah. And talking about a project, I guess I would call it, that uh, my family and I worked on a few years ago after my grandmother passed away. And I wrote a book about it. And so now I talk about the book and try to teach people about the history of the women air force service pilots. And I also use it to teach people, especially younger people, but sometimes older people need this lesson too, how Congress works and how to make change in the government. So what did you do? How did you learn to make change? What, what, tell me about what you did. So as I mentioned, my grandmother was one of the women Air Force service pilots during World War II. And in case anyone doesn't know who they are, which people listening to your podcast probably know who they are. But sometimes I speak to people who have never heard of them. That's true. But they, they were the first women to fly military planes for the United States Army during World War II. And they didn't fly combat missions. They only flew domestically for the most part. There was an early portion of them that flew in England, but like... They flew domestically and then men, so there were more male pilots to go overseas to fly combat 
Anyway, so they were not recognized for their service during World War II, and it took several decades for them to finally get recognized by Congress, which took a big lobbying effort in the 1970s. So when I was growing up, I always saw my grandma as a veteran. She had a uniform, and she went and did things like this and talked to museums and went to schools and air shows, and she went to Oshkosh uh, to talk about her service with people. And I never thought of her as anything but a veteran. Um, like my, my dad flew in Vietnam for the United States Marine Corps. He flew helicopters and I have other, you know, veterans in my family and she seemed the same to me, but she passed away in April of 2015 and she wanted to be buried at Arlington National Cemetery. And when my mother filled out the paperwork and applied to have her there, they rejected the application because a month before my grandmother died, the army, which runs Arlington National Cemetery decided that the women Air Force Service pilots were not eligible to be there on their own merit. My grandfather was not in the military, and he's buried at a civilian cemetery. Uh, so she couldn't be ba buried there as a spouse. And so they rejected the application. So, so that was your beginning of your... That was the beginning of our, our project. I did some research, and my mom did some research, and we were talking, and we decided to fight this decision by the army. And uh, I led a campaign with my family to create a public awareness of this problem. And at first, my goal was kind of to make the army look bad and hope they would change their minds. But then I realized, even if they changed their mind and changed the rule, you know, they could change it again later on. So then I realized we needed to get a law passed through Congress to uh, force the Army to recognize the service of the women Air Force service pilots and allow them to be buried at Arlington Cemetery. And so that's what we did. And we went to Congress. I spent a few months on Capitol Hill walking around. I visited more than 150 offices in person, talking to staff and members of Congress, uh, both senators and members of the House of Representatives. And we had a wonderful member of the House of Representatives, who is a former A-10 pilot, retired Air Force colonel woman, uh, Martha McSally, who uh, wrote this legislation to get this done. And eventually it was signed into law by the president of the United States in May 2016. And then my mom reapplied at Arlington for my grandmother, and we were able to have a funeral for her there in September of 2016, about a year and a half after she died and getting a law passed through Congress. Wow. <laughs> that's, a, that's a long journey. And it's amazing how people like you exist to like live out these legacies for people and these mm -hmm. dreams. Yeah. Know? It's, it's weird. Cause my grandmother was very, I was, Natalie and I were talking earlier about how women especially are often not very uh, appreciative of all the things they've accomplished and they're they're much more likely to kind of downplay their accomplishments and just kind of be like, yeah, it's no big deal. I'm just, you know, one of the first women to fly military planes in World War II. And my grandmother and many of the WASP are like that. You know, they just wanted to serve their country and they happen to have this skill of being able to fly a plane and the country needed them and that's what they did. Kind of like you know, a lot of other people during World War II, they went and did things to serve the country. And so that's how she thought of it for a long time. But because they didn't go out and talk about it and do anything, they also were not recognized and people forgot about them. So there's kind of this balance between talking about yourself and doing it in a way to not become completely like egotistical, but doing it in a way to serve people and let other people learn about what you've done and how it fits in the context of history. And I think that's what she wanted to do. But yeah, it was detrimental to them that they kind of were like, whatever, we'll just go home and do our thing and not talk about ourselves. But it was pretty typical of World War II veterans. I think they just wanted to move on and the whole country wanted to move on. And, you know, we didn't really talk about a lot of that until like the 90s, the late 90s, maybe when Tom Brokaw's book. Was it Tom Brokaw? Oh, yeah. Bro the, greatest the Greatest Generation. Generation. Yeah. Yeah. So when we started realizing, oh, maybe we should talk to all these people from World War II and gather their experiences. And, you know, my grandma did a lot of video recordings about her experience. So that's really fortunate for us mm -hmm. now because she's not here anymore. So people all over the world can log in, like, to the Library of Congress or 
different places that she did video interviews and watch yeah. her talk about what she did. That's so cool. Yeah. So how did she actually get into aviation though before? Cause I know to get into that program and there's two different programs, right? The, the WAFS, the Farian squadron. So what, how did, how did she get into that? She was flying before. Yeah. So in order to apply for the program, you had to already have a pilot's license. So my grandmother went to the University of Maryland for college and her last year of college, she saw an advertisement in the student newspaper for the civilian pilot training program, which was a program started by the government to get more people interested in aviation and get them pilot's licenses because they kind of had a foreshadowing that we would be involved in a world war that, you know, we would need people who knew how to fly eventually. So this program was attached to lots of universities across the country, including Tuskegee university and university of Maryland where my grandma went and So she applied to this program, which I think you got 35 hours of ground school and you got ground school and I think 35 hours of flight time, I think. Anyway, it was $40. Wow. And and since she was not married and a woman and I think under 21, she had to get permission from her parents to try out this program. And also they only took one woman for every 10 men. So I don't know if other men didn't apply or she just like got lucky, but whatever. She got into the program. Her dad gave her $40 to, and signed her permission slip so she could learn how to fly her senior year of college. And it was out here at College Park, Maryland. Yeah. The oldest continuously operating airport in the world. I know. I want to go there so bad. Let's do it. Yeah. And there's also a museum there now. She has her, her gold medal and her um, uniform and things are there. So... That's if you so come cool. visit, you can see it. Yeah. Anyway, so that's when she learned how to fly was her last year of college. And then she didn't really, I think, fly much until she applied for the WASP program, which was later in uh, 1943. Mm-hmm. It was just a couple years, a few years after she graduated. Did she ever talk about flying with you or any yeah, of the so, grandchildren? Yeah, she talked about flying. Like, it wasn't a secret. I mean, she... So after this stuff in the 1970s, when the WASP had to go to Congress and get a law passed so they would be recognized as veterans, she and some of the other WASP really spent a lot of time uh, going around, like I said, lecturing and and doing talks at schools and things. So I would see her a lot putting on her uniform to go to some event or whatever, you know, a lot, you know, oh, I'm going to the White House. Like, okay, grandma, like, whatever. That was normal. (laughs) Yeah. Normal. My grandma. (laughs) White House. Okay, like, yeah, know. or like, oh, I'm going to the anniversary of the Air Force with like, you know, the Secretary of Defense or whatever. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> she lived. She lived. We live here, you know, right next, like, you know, right next to D.C. So she was invited to a lot of that stuff as a representative of the WASP. So we knew what she did. It wasn't like a secret, but at the same time, it's not like she sat around talking about it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but she took me to air shows when I was little and we used to go to the 94th Aero Squadron restaurant and watch planes take off and things like that. Yeah, she, you know, she talked about it. she enjoyed it a lot. Did she fly anymore after the program ended? No, she did not. She uh so after she was already married when she went into the WASP program and after she uh after the program ended and my grandfather came back from Asia, uh, they moved back to Maryland and had four kids and my grandfather passed away before I was born. And so my grandma was a single mom mm. and had four kids and had to go, you know, work and help raise her kids. So she didn't really have time to be flying around. Why was it important in the 70s for for the WASP? What were they trying to accomplish when they went and what were they trying to be recognized? What was the, the deal? What were they trying to do? So during World War II, they were hired by the United States Army to fly planes. And as you mentioned before, there were two programs, the Women's Auxiliary Fairing Squadron and the Women's Flying Training Detachment that were started by two different women, Nancy Love and Jackie Cochran, who kind of organized these two different programs. One was more of like a training thing for you know, newer pilots. And then the fairing squadron, the idea behind that one was we'll take experienced women and just have them ferry planes around the country and stuff. But then eventually the programs merged and became the women air force service pilots. 
But this whole time, the army was arguing about, like, oh, well, should women really be in the army flying planes? Like, you know, that seems kind of crazy. At the same time, right, women were joining the Navy, all these different branches doing other things, but they weren't pilots. So they were kind of hung up on the fact that they were becoming pilots and not secretaries or whatever. So in order to have them be formally part of the army, they needed to pass a law through Congress to make them you know, part of the army, and that did not pass. It failed by 19 votes in the summer of 1944. So they decided to cancel the program at the end of 1944, and they all just went home, and that was it. So, like I said before, a lot of World War II veterans, and, you know, they, they too, they went home and kind of eventually, in, you know, in, the for, in 1945, and the war ended, and people started coming home, and they wanted to move on and not talk about this stuff. So they were never fully recognized as having served their country as part of the army, even though 38 of them died during service. Uh, it was just they were pushed away. Like it was just like pushed away, like in this corner, like it never happened. Exactly. So, you know, and, and I guess for a time that was fine with them because that was just how things were. But then in the 1970s, the service academies started to accept women and the Air Force which was formed in 1947, started training, you know, was going to start accepting female pilots into training programs. And so, you know, there were more women coming up in, you know, commercial airlines and all this stuff. And they were like saying, oh, these are going to be the first women to do this. And my grandma and her Mm. friends were like, we did this like 35 years ago. Yeah, wrong. Yeah. (laughs) So maybe we should go tell someone about it. So they went to Congress and were like, we should have been part of the army. So they went to Congress, they testified before Congress and talked about what they had done and the different roles they played and and the fact that they were expected to become part of the army and that was you know an understanding they had when they went to texas to go train and eventually uh, after a few years uh, congress finally added language in the gi reauthorization bill in 1977 which was led by senator barry goldwater who had actually worked with some of the WASPs during World War II and kind of knew about the program and was like, these women, you know, deserve to be recognized. And this law passed, which allowed their group and anybody else to apply for recognition as veterans to the Department of Defense, which took another two years. So in 1979, my grandma finally got her DD-214, 35 years after she served. Wow. Saying that she had been part of the United States Army on active duty. But her DD-214 has an asterisk, which states that it is only for laws administered by the, the Veterans Administration, which today is the Department of Veterans Affairs. So this is where this little problem with Arlington comes in, which is the Department of Veterans Affairs runs um, about 136 national military cemeteries across the country, like Quantico Cemetery in Virginia and all these other ones. But Arlington National Cemetery is still run by the Department of the Army. So basically, the Army was claiming that my grandmother was only a veteran in one one part of the federal government and not the rest of the federal government. Gotcha. Okay. So this is where that little technicality comes in. So, I mean, it's interesting that you were the person that seemed to kind of, it seemed like everything kind of lined up and it just seemed to fall into your lap because you kind of had a little bit of knowledge about, you know, law and stuff like that. And would you agree or what, how did it come to be your thing other than, you know, it was your grandmother. You took it on because you obviously you felt like you could probably handle it and do it. Yeah. So when this happened, I had just, uh, I had finished law school a couple years before that. And I was still living with my mother. And so when she was talking on the phone and dealing with these people, I was, you know, obviously there. And so we'd talk about it. And so I'd always go and do research and be like, is this what they're telling her? This is this really true? And I'd go look it up and be like, yeah, this is true. So we have to figure out what to do. And then eventually I was like, I think we need to get a law passed to fix this. And my mom was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) And then I got really mad and she's like, well, I'm going to write a letter to the army. And I was like, okay, well, that's great, but I don't think that's going to fix this problem. So then I decided to 
basically have like a PR campaign and go to the media and talk to people and get them to get attention to this issue. And the meantime, my, obviously the rest of my family, you know, they were mad too. And so my sister and I, and uh, we all kind of created this petition on change.org to help get more attention to the issue and shared that with everybody. And so then all my family was having all their friends and, you know, work coworkers and things sign it and everyone was starting to get to know it. And a lot of groups like women in aviation and the 99s and EAA and AOPA, and they, they caught on and sent it to all their members. And we're like, you guys need to sign this. You need to call, you know, your Congress members and tell them to do something about this. Yeah. So that's, I just, I was geographically here. Like, yeah. my, you know, I live, you know, nine miles from the Capitol building and, yeah. I am a lawyer and I just like yeah. it all like kind of just you I had time, have, right? You <laughs> I don't know. We have to have those people that care enough to get everybody else to make action on it. And you might not like I might not be able to do it by myself, but I, I can find somebody that can, you know, and yeah, it's it's, it's amazing that, you know, it, it just takes one person or, you know, a family to start questioning things and that kind of stir this huge yeah raise awareness yeah right yeah so I just kind of had you know I would I did have a full-time job but I I spent a lot of my time dealing with this and you know my sisters don't live around here anymore and you know my my mom you know loves her letter writing but I was like that's not gonna (laughs) complete the thing but we need everybody you know so like we have all kinds of different things happening and so yeah, I just was kind of, I guess, the de facto leader at that point in time because yeah. of my circumstances. Right, right. So I've I've read your book, um, you know, and it was there's interesting it, when you're talking about it now, you know, just remembering like a lot of the conversations you had with your mom and how your sister, what was her name, Hillary? No, what's her name? I, I have two sisters. One is named Whitney, and one is named Tiffany. Whitney and Tiffany. That's right. Yeah. And just hearing the stories of how much work, you know, you had you'd leave work or how and your work was pretty worked with you pretty well on a lot of the time that you took off and everything to to get some of those things done. Because it seemed like, I mean, a lot of time had to be spent kind of hitting the pavement and and doing talking. Yeah. Initially, I was just doing lots of media interviews and we had the petition. I was doing lots of phone call and email. And then one day I was like, I need to be like after the legislation got introduced, I was like, I need to be down on Capitol Hill talking to people because, you know, there's like 10,000 pieces of legislation introduced in Congress every session. And somebody has to go down there and be like, you see this one piece of legislation, it's really important to my family. And I need you to support this just because yeah. there's so much going on. You need someone there to like, tell them like, hi, this is important. Can you please right. pay attention to this? Right. So yeah. that's when I started going down there like a lot and talking to people. Yeah. Wow. But yeah, my work was funny. So where I was working at the time, we could, we had kind of flex hours. So I think we could go in at 6am. We could go between like six and nine thirty, I think. And then you would just work like whatever hours made up the day and then leave at the end of that. So I would go to work at like six in the morning a lot and then leave early and go to Capitol Hill and spend the rest of the day on Capitol Hill. Yeah. Hi, it's Chuck from Soaring the Sky, a glider pilots podcast. Join us each week as we talk to glider pilots from all over the world as they share their story and their adventures in the air. You can find us on your favorite podcast app, I hope you join us soon on Soaring the Sky. And we also had days where we could work on Saturday and then you could like take off a day during the week. So I would do that a lot too. It must have been weird when it when it was all done. I mean, did you feel like you didn't have anything to do? Because No, it so totally busy. was. It was like, oh, now all of a sudden what? I have nothing to do other than my normal full-time job. And it felt really weird yeah, to not I be bet. busy because I was only sleeping from like midnight to 4 30 oh my god for like a few months there wow that's but yeah and then all of a sudden it's like oh i just have to go do my normal job and that's it (laughs) (laughs) yeah so that all finished Uh, at what point did you write the book and had you had experience with that or was this just something 
you wanted to talk about your experience or or the whole process or? So the funny thing about the book is during this whole process, you know, I was doing all these interviews with the news people or talking to people at Congress or whatever. And they'd be like, this is such a great story. You should write a book about it. it would make a great book. And I'd be like, yeah, it would make a great book, whatever. And then <laughs> whatever. when, <laughs> yeah. And then when all of a sudden I had nothing to do, I was like, oh, I was kind of organizing all of our stuff. And, you know, I just had piles of papers everywhere, like notes I had taken and magazines and newspaper articles. My mom bought every, you know, newspaper and people were mailing us newspapers from their town across the country, which was wow. really, really sweet. Like they'd be like, you're, you were in our random little town newspaper Aww. today. So it was really cute. So we had all this stuff and I was kind of organizing it all. And I was like, look at all this stuff I have. And I have all these emails and whatever. And I, I could write a book. So I decided I should do it myself. And no, I have not written a book before. Although I do, you know, I have a, a master's degree and I had to write a quite a long thing for that. And I have a law degree, which is a lot of writing, but like, no, I've never written a book before. Right. But all these people were like, you need to write a book. So I started writing it. And then when I started telling people about it, they were like, oh, good, you're writing a book. When's the book going to be done? And then I and then I had to finish it because people kept asking yeah. about it. <laughs> you can't talk yeah. about it unless you're going to go through with it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So the summer um, before my grandma's funeral, I wrote most of the book. And then obviously when her funeral happened and I had to add that in the book. And then I worked with my editor for like a year to move everything around and make it readable because the first draft was like legitimately terrible it was just like blah 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 all this stuff happened (laughs) here's a million people she was like they don't need to know the name of every person you're interacted with and I was like okay (laughs) (laughs) so she was very helpful in like you know making it more of a story and flowing well and not just like bombarding with facts because I try to teach because it's a lot to explain, right? I have to explain the history of the wasp, which is a lot. And then, yeah. and you have to make it interesting, not just like this happened on this date and then this other thing happened. Right. right? And then you need more than just facts. You got to. Yeah. Have like, and then yeah. I have to explain how my grandma fits in that picture. And then I wanted to explain my relationship with my grandmother, why it was important to her to be there and why I felt like it was important to work so hard to make sure she got what she wanted even after she was gone. And then you have to explain the process of getting things through Congress and why we had to do that instead of just, you know, whatever else, which is also not too exciting, right? Like talking about legislating and writing bills and having a million meetings where you say the same thing over and over and over again, Yeah. like trying to make all of that interesting and explain it to people in a way that they find you know, some attachment or value to it is, is hard. I thought it was really good. You did a great job. Um, cause oh, I wouldn't you. have wanted to read a book that was all about that. <laughs> I like the whole like emotional part and the stories, you know, about yeah. people and everything. So how you mix it in with your, your grandmother. And I just, I'm always, I don't know. There's people like in history that I think, what were they, what was it like? I mean, you know, what was, what was she thinking and why did she, why was it important for her to be buried at Arlington? So she had gone to several funerals of other wasps that were buried at Arlington. She's not the first one. A lot of people think she's the first one and she's not. There's a lot of other ones there. A lot of them were buried as someone's spouse. Cause you know, at that time, like a lot of people were in the military and a lot of them right. obviously were meeting other people in the military. So they're married to other people in the Navy or the air force and the army or whatever. Uh, so they were buried as a spouse. Some of them didn't get a funeral. They just buried them, which oh, my grandmother okay. was, you know, pretty chafed at, mm. but she decided she wanted to be there because Arlington is, You know, they get millions of visitors every year, people who don't know anyone that was buried there. They just go there because, you know, whether they go because John F. Kennedy is buried there to see the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier or whatever. She kind of was hoping they would walk around the cemetery or look up people that were buried there and see like, oh, this person was in the wasp. What's the wasp? Let me look it up and learn about it. And so that's kind of why she wanted to be there. Yeah. Plus, like, we are from this area, and that's a cemetery that is near us, you know. Right. It's, right. We have my my great-grandfather is buried there. My 
great great oh, aunt is wow. buried there. My great great yeah. aunt served in the Navy in World War One. Oh my goodness. Yeah, wow. so we have other people there, so it's not like, you know, totally ob- obscure to to have someone to so, want to be there. So the wasps that were actually like that were killed in service or whatever had happened. What about them? Like, what? Where are they? Did they were they able to be buried in these places? Because I mean, it was active duty, but not active duty, and. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So since they were not technically part of the military at the time, that was an issue, right? And there's an interesting story I learned along the way in this process about Hazel Ying Li, who is one of the two Chinese American oh, yeah. women in the WASP, and she yeah. died in service. <clears throat> and since she was Chinese descent, uh, the f- cemetery where her family wanted to bury her wouldn't bury her because they were anti-Chinese. And so her, her family actually had a fight with the cemetery. I think they were from Oregon. They had a fight with the local cemetery where they wanted to bury her. And eventually, I think they won and they got her buried there. And also really sad is her brother, who was also serving in the army, died like three days before or after her. Oh. So her family lost two kids in wow. the course of like three days. Wow. And, and, and had to fight with the cemetery about all of this. Mm. So, Yeah. But yeah, no, you're right. They were not recognized. They did not get, you know, the the same payout that people in active service got or their families would get, you know, for losing a family member. They Their families didn't have a gold star in the window. They didn't get a flag on the casket, like nothing like that. Yeah, and the women that actually died, you know, when they were varying planes and everything at the time, like their families had to pay for them to be sent back and buried and everything right yeah so they didn't really get anything i think they got like two hundred dollars yeah uh but yeah my grandma said so my grandma had two women die in her class Mm -hmm. and they passed a hat around and collected money to send it home with the body to help their families wow Uh, and they usually had one of the wasps escort them back to their family with the Mm -hmm. with the body but yeah one this one wasp i i know here who has passed away um, and was buried at Arlington uh, with her husband. She told me that someone in her class died and the telegram from the army to her family said, you know, something like your daughter died in an accident yesterday. Where should we send the body? Question mark. And like, oh that my was gosh. it. How awful. Oh. Yeah. I was, reading, I was reading, I can't remember what book it was uh, just recently. And it was talking about, you know, um, them in training and somebody had passed away and it was like one of their roommates and of course it was kind of a glorified you know story of you know to make it interesting but yeah I wondered how much that was true and like it it really talked about how there wasn't much to be said after something happened and here's here's your child back you know yeah and it's 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 very sad and very cold and I, I think a lot of it you know if you watch some World War II movies and even people in active duty, I think a lot of the time where it was very much root, like uh, routine is a, maybe not the right like word. Matter of fact, kind of very like, matter of fact, like the army yeah. would just be like, you know, your, your son died. Like here's, you know, the end, you know, yeah. very cold. So I read a lot of books about I mean, which books are your favorites. I'm reading one right now, something about silver wings, the girl, mm-hmm. something that's it's kind of a newer one. And I'm always interested in hearing about these planes that these women flew because, <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, you know, these Mustangs and, and P-40s and P-38s. And it's like those are some serious airplanes. And it would take me a long time to feel confident in, in those and these women that, that did it. That's just so awesome. Yeah, they flew. So the Wasp flew every sort of plane that was available at the time to the Army from the little training planes all the way to the B-29s. So, yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. My grandma flew just like the basic training planes. And then uh, she was a co-pilot on the B-17 bomber when they were moving it around, I guess. Yeah. But her main yeah. job after she did training was training men on instrument training in a BT-13. She okay. was stationed at Las Vegas uh, Airfield, which we call Nellis Air Force Base. Yeah. Today. Yeah. Uh, so she right. worked out there with her best friend, Maggie, 
Mm. Maggie was a tow target pilot. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So Maggie towed the banners and the men would shoot at them for practice. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. Yeah. But there's women, they were flying. Um, you know, there were women who flew the AT tens and ferried different planes around the country. And like I said, flew the B 29s, um, all the different ones, if either ferrying them or testing them or whatever P 51s. Yeah. But so I don't know, you've, many, gone through ratings, many, you've gone through ratings pretty fast. I feel like you could learn to fly a warbird. <laughs> I hope that's my goal. I'm trying to get there. I, I have a lot more hours than your grandmother would, would have had, probably. <laughs> she had, like, like 35 that. hours when she started. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> wow. Insane. It's so cool, their stories. And, like, that it cost her $40 to get her pilot's license. You know, yeah. it's like... When she... Back, after, after she passed away, we had, you know, we were at her house and we were cleaning her house out and stuff. And I was in her office and I was cleaning her desk out and I found a receipt, which I wish I, I feel like I kept it, but now I don't know where it went. But I found a receipt. She had taken a few lessons before she applied to the WASP because it had, like I said, it had been a few years since she took that class. And her lessons were $7.50 an hour for flying lessons. Wow. Insane. (laughs) (laughs) Now you've seen. It seems that you've kind of formed a relationship with a lot of the remaining wasp, and I don't know how many are left now. But I think they're they're under thirty. I want to say like twenty six or twenty seven. Yeah. Tell me about. I I knew I I got to I they're weird. It's like I encountered them over the years when I was a kid, but I didn't think very much about it. It was like my grandma's friends, like whatever. And then after this happened, you know, we needed to tell my mom was very insistent that they all be involved and aware of what was going on. So we called them a lot and emailed them and would kind of try to keep them up to date on what was going on because, you know, it was for them and we wanted them to, you know, know what was happening. So I would email them stories or my mom would call their families. So we tried to keep everyone up to date and a lot of them are really nice. They did lots of media interviews and uh, with whoever, wherever state they lived in, you know, the media would go do an interview with them. So that was nice. And yeah. they were very helpful. So yeah. Betty Strophis in Minnesota, unfortunately, she passed away in the middle of this campaign oh. um, before the law got passed. And she did a couple interviews with Senator Klobuchar from Minnesota. So that was really nice that the senator and went there and Betty wanted to, you know, give an interview and, but yeah, it was sad that she passed away before the law got, but yeah, so I kind of got to know them and, and when they were uh, more mobile, they would come to the air shows and it was nice to see them at the air shows and watch them talk to the young kids, especially and very inspirational, you know? Yeah. 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 How old are they now? Mostly. So one of them just turned 99. Wow. So, yeah, they're late 90s, 100s here. Yeah. You know. <laughs> what class was your grandmother in? What class was it? 44-9, which was the second to last class. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, she finished in the fall of 1944 and then went to Las Vegas for a few months before the program was ended. Okay. Yeah, I love reading about what the conditions were like and everything there in, in Sweetwater and how they lived and what they would do for fun and, and stuff like that. It's very interesting. Yeah, she yeah, she had fun. She enjoyed being with all of her friends. Like when she when I think about what she talks about the wasp, it wasn't even necessarily the planes, even though she did like that. It was mostly about being with all these women. And I know she I found her diary before or while this was happening. And she talks about being really nervous to meet all these women. I think she had an assumption that they all would have all this experience, you know, and she just had her little 35 hours from doing that program. And she was like, they're all going to be so much better than me. And it was weird because I never heard my grandma talk like that. Mm. But once she got there and realized everyone had different experience and some of them were like her, they also had just done this, the civilian pilot program. Yeah. And, and it was irrelevant anyway, because they all had to go through the training program together. So even if they had been flying a lot, like I know some were from farms, they'd been flying crop dusters or whatever, oh, you yeah. know, 
like they had a lot of hours, but they all had to learn. No one had flown an army plane before. So, it, right. you know, in the end, it didn't really matter. They had to all learn the same stuff. But yeah. that was her favorite part was like being with all these women and hanging out together and getting to and having all these friends that she made for the rest of her life. And if you think about it today, we don't have, you know, they had a different experience than my friends who are, you know, pilots in the Air Force today or, you know, have retired recently because they they were going through training a lot of times. They were the only woman in their squadron. They were the only often one or two women in flight training and they're by themselves a lot. And my grandma's experience was totally the opposite. They were all women because they were all on one base together. So it it was kind of interesting to hear them compare that experience. Yeah, that'd be nice. I mean, I think especially going through something as intensive as, you know, the flight training and learning all these new airplanes to have kind of a family support there, you know? Yeah, she she became, I think, very attached to a lot of them. And then it was interesting because even though she didn't know at the time a lot of the women in the other classes, she said later on when they started getting together for reunions or going to museums and stuff, she would meet women she had never met. But, like, they were immediately best friends because yeah. they had this connection. Right. Like, that's with pilots as well. I mean, like, I love flying airplanes, but I think my love for flying has, like, blossomed even more now that I have all these like amazing women that are pilots and we all like have the same like excitement and like our friends back home might not get it, you know, and it's, I I get that too at air shows. Like my friends think I'm crazy going to air shows and stuff every weekend, (laughs) but, but it's like when, when, when you're with like our group of people, it's like, it's just an instant connection, whether you're 80 years old or 20 years old or anywhere in between. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And yeah. my friends that are, you know, that are kind of the real, like, direct legacy of her, like, that were, that are, you know, military pilots feel very connected to them. And it's it's interesting mm. to see them together. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. You're right. So you go to air shows. And what, what do you, why do you go to air shows typically? What are you doing there? So I, I went to air shows when I was a kid. We went. Yeah you know, fairly often, um, just cause we, did grew you up like in the, it in the DC area and the, the Andrews air force base has showed like there's shows around here. Yeah. I liked it. It was fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, and my grandma went with us a lot, but I don't know. I never like got that bug or whatever to, yeah, I was going to say, when are you going to get your pilot <laughs> license? I don't know. I, I do. I do have my little card. So like technically I signed up or whatever. I just haven't yeah. done it. I don't know. <laughs> People ask about it all the time. Yeah. So, but obviously I started going more when all this was happening, people started inviting me. Like, we want you to come talk about the wasp and talk about what happened. And I was, I was really very honored that it was nice. Like the first reason I went to Oshkosh in 2016, uh, a friend of mine who is, Uh, an air force pilot had been going forever since she was a kid. And she's like, you have to go. It's the best thing. We'll go together. And I was like, all right. And then right before the show, she was like, Oh, I can't go. And I was like, look, I Googled this. It looks like a really big deal. Like, I don't feel like I should go alone. And she's like, you'll be fine. But I really was going to thank all these people who were supporting our family when all this was happening. Right. Yeah. And it was really an honor and amazing to see all these people that we're so happy to see me. And, and I was like, I really want to thank you for supporting our family. It meant a lot to us. And I know a lot of you called your congressperson or signed our petition or whatever. And it was important to us. And, you know, I can't obviously thank like millions of people at once, but it's nice to be able to be in that community and like meet all those people and thank them. Yeah. Do you still like to go? Of course we haven't been in a long time. <laughs> I but, do. I, so I, yeah. I went to Oshkosh 16, 17, 18, 19, four years. Yeah. Yeah. um, And they will, you know, they want me to do talks and it was really nice. The EA museum did a WASP exhibit this year. And so it's been really nice that they're, the aviation community is still very supportive of the women air force service pilots and their history and making sure people know about them. And, you know, like you mentioned there, there aren't that many of them left. And so part of that now falls to, their grandchildren or other pilots to make sure that people learn about them. Right. Yeah. I never heard about them until I was an adult. Yeah. And that's part of the reason I wrote the book is 
to help people, you know, just to have a record of, you know, here's this thing I did for my grandma. And part of the lesson is, you know, if you don't teach people about what you did and talk about it, then people will forget about it. Right. And then one day your granddaughter is going to have to go to Congress to get you buried because no one knows what you did. So, (laughs) you know, it's like remembering history, but learning why it's important, you know, but not in a, you know, my grandma would never have said like, oh, I'm so great. Like, look at this great thing I did. It was more like I did this thing and it was important in the context of history and people need to know about it. And, you know, it's important to talk about it. So part of the thing I, I think was also they learned is because they didn't talk about what they were doing when the women in the 1970s were going through training, it's like they had to do everything all over again. Yeah. Because they didn't build on those initial steps from World War II. So my grandma saw that and was like, we need to make sure we're constantly building and not forgetting things, you know, so you don't have to start over again. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. So when you buried your grandmother, what did you feel relief? Did you feel what was it like? When it was so all when we finally got to the funeral, which, as I mentioned, was about a year and a half after she died, I was pretty much over the like sadness part of it because yeah. it had been so long. and and because I had to spend time in Congress explaining this over and over again to people, I would have like waves of sadness because there was no closure, right? My grandma's yeah. ashes were sitting in our closet and we're just kind of like it's like nothing's finished. And then when the funeral finally happened, It was more like a happy day because we were, you know, Mm -hmm. things were done and we were, it was like a celebration. So we had the funeral. And then after the funeral, we had a memorial service at the Women and Military Service for America Memorial in Arlington next to the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people came, which was great. And they, you know, very supportive. And, And I had some of my friends who are military pilots speak and, Senator McSally spoke and which was really nice because, you know, she could talk about her experience and like her legacy and then why it was important to her to get this legislation done. And, you know, I had uh, some of the WASP were able to come. And so we had a lot of really nice people there to celebrate them. And it was more like celebrating the WASP and not just like my yeah. grandma, my right. grandma passing away. You know, it was like right. a celebration, too. This, so that was this nice group of people that. Yeah. Yeah. So what's next for Aaron? I don't know. People ask that and I really don't know the answer. (laughs) Did you you like writing the book? You want to write another book? I don't know. Writing a book's pretty, pretty challenging. I bet. People liked it, which is nice. You know, it's nerve wracking too. You're writing a book. You're writing, like I was writing about real people. You get nervous. Like you don't want them to feel like you've portrayed them poorly, right? right? Or inaccurately or in some strange way. And So that's nice. And people, you know, they call me and they're like, I cried or so you feel like you're bringing value, like people are learning something. You know, I when I was going to write it, I was trying I was looking for books about people who had gone to Congress to, to like to get this done something in their life. And I couldn't really find any. And I was like, this is important. Like a lot of people don't know what that's like. You know, they're in other parts of the country. They Washington can be a very abstract idea. Right. Like. True. And they don't know what it's like to sit in an office with a senator and be like, I need you to sign this because my grandma's ashes are sitting in a closet and I need her buried. Right. It's, yeah. you know, it's it's important to people to see like there's a real connection. It's not just this abstract concept out in the world. True. Right. So, exactly. yeah, I don't know. I If I wrote another book, I don't know what I would write. I feel like I'd write, like, some crime novel or something, like, something not true, like, made up. <laughs> People would be like, why are you writing that? <laughs> it is a lot harder to write things that are actually based on real things because you don't want to screw up the facts. Yeah, you don't want to mess up the facts. You, like I said, you don't want people to think, like, why is she saying I'm whatever? Right. You know, and you're just, like, a little nerve-wracked. It'd be a lot easier at least if you're making up stuff. Up. Like, I don't know, this person's made up. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it can be whatever I want. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. It's it's challenging. I, I, I think part of it was I was totally naive at like how challenging it would be so I just was like I'm gonna do it and then once I started like I told you people were like when's the book done and I was like well now I have to finish it so yeah yeah you know it's very determined yeah but I think once you do it once it's probably a little easier right because you you know what's going on you get probably I don't know how you did it in the midst of all the other stuff you were doing (laughs) golly yeah I I dream about writing a book and and then I think about oh my god all the work that has to go into that 
not this year. <laughs> yeah, you have like 30 notebooks and you yeah. go away every single night and writing scratch papers and yeah. 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 I've got a lot of material. <laughs> yeah. But one day it'll come to you. One day you'll have like this sense okay. of like, okay, I can do this now. Yeah, I think, I think I will. I just need to like, I have a plan. See, I have to have a plan and like pace it. Like if I'm like, I'm going to write a book in a month. No, that's not going to happen <laughs> too much. That's me. That's me. I'm like, I'm going to put out a book next week. You know? <laughs> like, I'm quitting my job and I'm living in a van and I'm writing a book, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, are you still selling quite a bit of the book? I mean, not as many as before, but people yeah. still buy it. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's nice, and it's in a lot of libraries, which is good. Um, yeah. Kids occasionally, or students, I shouldn't say kids, young people email me and say, oh, I got your book at the library. I'm doing a project in the WASP or whatever, which is really nice because that's kind of the whole point, right? It's, yeah, right. You know, having them learn about things. Yeah. So what's the name of the book? Yeah, how do we tell our listeners about your book? Yeah, so the book is called Final Flight, Final Fight. There it is. You want to have video? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, video. yeah. We didn't talk about the tattoo you have on your arm. Oh, yeah. So, yes. Final Flight, Final Fight. I have a website. You can buy it on any of your favorite online retailers. Yes. Or ask your library to purchase it. Here's right. the tattoo. Can you see? Let's see. Yeah. Does it come out well? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what better way to celebrate getting a law pass than getting it tattooed on your arm? Right. I love yeah, it. So. Alyssa, Alyssa has some tattoos, so she's you. I have you my dog like a tattoo bond. <laughs> do anything that's spectacular other than have animals, but <laughs> yeah. So during this process, at one point, I was very frustrated. I don't remember exactly why, but I was talking to my sister, and I was like, "Oh, this is just so frustrating." But we're gonna get this done, and it's gonna happen. And when we get it done, I'm gonna get a tattoo of something of this bill or something. I have yeah. to get a tattoo. And she's like, okay, I'm holding you to that. And I was like, all right, whatever. And then I kind of forgot about it. And then when the White House uh, announced that the president was going to sign the bill, I was like, oh, I guess I have to get it tattooed. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's really cool. No one else has that tattoo. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I, I might have to get one just to, like, remember the loss. <laughs> Not that I passed it or anything, but... Yeah. That's very cool. Do you have any other tattoos? I have one other tattoo on my leg, but it's certainly not significant. It's just like a design. Yeah. I don't have I've any met, I, I know some people that have Fifi Nella tattoos. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's a good one you could get. Yeah. So tell us about Fifi Nella. So Fifi Nella is the little... Can't really get, oh, she can't really see her on the she picture. She doesn't have it on her jacket? Oh, yeah. 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 But it's like half, it's like cut off. Didn't Disney like create that? So Disney created Fifi Nella as part of the Gremlins series, which was based on a book by Roald Dahl. And there were a, 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 group of, a group of these little, little whatever they're called, n imps or something. And Fifi Nella is, I think, supposed to be a girl imp. And she has wings and little goggles. So... Walt Disney drew this design and the women Air Force Service pilots had the license from Walt Disney to use it as their mascot. So it's know, pretty cool. Do they cool. sell anything with that on there anymore? At the, I think at the Wasp Museum in Texas, they sell yeah. some things that have it on there. I need to go down there and get me something. <laughs> they they also have an online store. You can buy it online. I need to do that. I would like to go down there and check it out. You've been, um, how many times have you been? I a think lot. that's also four years. Okay. So normally they have a big event um, Memorial Day weekend and the wasp that can come fly there and they have a, a whole day with the wasp and a big dinner and whatever. Um, yeah. Obviously the pandemic this year did not happen, but yeah. So yes, there's a museum in Sweetwater, Texas where they trained yeah. during World War II. Well, at least when my yeah. grandma was there, they originally started in Houston, but then moved to Sweetwater later. What's what's yeah. Sweetwater like? Sweetwater is in western Texas. Yeah. There, there are a lot of wind windmills there. It's very okay. windy. It's very windy. Yeah. So they have a lot of the wind power happening there. I think there's okay. a lot of what's that um, shale 
the oil, not the oil drilling, but some of the shale stuff. The, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, fracking or something? Fracking. Yes. Uh, yeah. So a lot of natural resources out there. And apparently they're very well known for their rattlesnakes as well. They uh. have a rattlesnake, <laughs> rattlesnake roundup every year. Uh. Interesting. Yeah. 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 So that's Sweetwater. Huh. But yeah, back in the day, I think it was very, very even smaller, very small town. But yeah, Avenger Field is there where they trained. Yeah. I think my grandma would say they would take taxis into town, like go to the movie theater and stuff. Yeah, right. That's so uh, interesting. Yeah. A lot of fun with those old pictures on the internet of, you know, the wasp and stuff like that. And it's not the wasps, right? Yeah. So that's yeah, right, that an learned ongoing book. discussion. So my grandma always said, and all of her friends and the wasps said, you say wasp because it's women Air Force Service pilots. So it's already plural. So if you had an S, that's weird. Yeah. But <laughs> a lot of um, news outlets use wasps. Because yeah. I don't know, whatever, that's their practice. I'm yeah. not an expert at grammar as to which is really correct. I just can't say it with an S because I feel like my grandma's looking down right. on me and yelling at me. So I would say she knows. <laughs> I mean, she was, she would be someone that would know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I know. I love that little factoid that I learned from your book. It's like, I'm never going <laughs> to say that again. <laughs> yeah. I think I had a discussion with someone from the New York times that was writing an article about the wasp, not about me, but something else involving somebody else around the same time though. And they were like fact checking with me. And I was like, well, my grandma says there's not supposed to be an S and she's like, well, our, our editorial system adds S. And I was like, well, yeah, I'm, you know, wrong. I don't, I'm not an expert. <laughs> I'm just telling you what my grandma told me. <laughs> yeah. And she knows. <laughs> and she knows. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Aaron, for coming on. It was really good to see you too. I'm glad we got to chat a little bit before. Well, it was very nice to see you too, and and talk Not to Alyssa. Me. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, hey guys, this has been Cockpits and Cocktails with Aaron Miller and our talk on the wasp and thank you guys so much for tuning in and we hope you tune in next time make sure you get on over and subscribe to our podcast on any of your favorite things um spotify apple all the good stuff and we will um not see you soon but we will uh put some more content out for you soon Driving.